committee, so I'll call tonight's EDA meeting to order. Commissioner, and Karen, could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Roberts. Here. Commissioner Husnick. Commissioner Lorge. Here. Commissioner Erickson. Here. And President Bain. Here. And so just maybe a quick note of, um, a quick note of um, process. So I noticed that we, so we do have Commissioner Lorge attending she is, she is remote, and so, however, I believe by our rules of procedure that we're not able to, she's not able to participate. She's able to view the meeting, but not able to participate in the meeting. Is that That's correct, our, or vote, at least or, vote. Or vote. Vote is probably the more important than participation. Correct, and so it, technically it does consider to be absent, but she's, she is here to view the, view the meeting. Is that, is that correct? Okay. Did you hear that, Jenny? <clears throat> yes, I was okay. just wondering why that's absent when we offer Zoom. So we technically do not offer Zoom for public officials for public meetings, so a attendee is able to participate in a meeting. You're, so you're able to attend as a meeting of, as a member of the public. You're not able mm -hmm. to attend and participate as a member of the governing board. No, we, we we're allowed to do that under emergency powers of COVID, but statutorily we cannot do Correct. that. So if we were to, yeah, so if we were to consider you to be part of the meeting, we would have had to have noticed your location as a public location and you would have to be in a library conference room or a hotel mm -hmm. lobby or a restaurant or a place where the public would be able to um, um, interact right. with you and kind of be present with you. But that said, glad you're able to participate remotely, and tonight's agenda does not have any votes required, and so um, glad you're able to. We'll, we'll make we'll make the best of it. Okay. Does that mean I can't comment at all either? No, you can comment. Comment okay. as so um, so I, it, because you are um, kind of interacting as a member of the public, we can just ask for moments of public comment and you're able to provide comment as well. Okay. Sure. All right. With that, um, we will um, invite everyone to rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, members of the EGA, we have an agenda before you, and I would look for a motion to approve the agenda. Also move. For a motion, there's second. and a second. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Oppose, and our agenda is approved. Because we don't have a quorum this evening, um, Dan and Karen, can we just move the approving the minutes to our next agenda? We'll officially take action on that at our next meeting. Which brings us to item six, the downtown plan update and the boat launch study scoping. And Dan. Yep. Uh, President, members of the EDA, uh, tonight we have uh, on the agenda is the downtown plan, uh, kind of an update on it, as well as the um, boat launch study scoping. Um, just to kind of summarize where we are in the downtown plan, um, the final plan was approved in July. So that has been approved as of July 25th. Um, the final draft has been posted on the investinforestlake.com website, so anybody wanting to see the final copy of, of the downtown plan can download a version uh, from that website. Um, we're still working on the funding plan for the downtown plan. There's a, quite a bit trying to figure out how to, we're going to fund everything, so staff is still working on the funding plan. And we'll bring that back once we sort of have get our you know, arms around sort of the funding mechanisms for the downtown plan. Um, but one thing that did come up as we kind of closed in on the approval of the downtown plan, um, it did become pretty clear uh, that much of the sequencing or staging of the projects that are outlined in the downtown plan were dependent upon if or can we move the boat launch downtown. So a lot of those other projects that sort of circled around that were very dependent upon that uh, possibility of the boat launch move. We also received lots of feedback and interest in that possibility of that being moved during the open houses and on the community forums as well. So that was probably an item where um, 
majority of the feedback came in on was a lot of questions and comments kind of surrounding that possibility of the downtown boat launch being moved. Um, so kind of given sort of the linchpin effect of that kind of that boat launch, um, you know, in the downtown planning in terms of the sequencing and staging of it, um, staff would be recommending that one of the first steps that we look at in the downtown plan or one of the next steps would be to look at a little bit deeper dive or a further study into the feasibility of uh, the possibility of moving that boat launch. Um, as the EDA is aware, um, the current boat launch that's downtown was funded through a grant that was obtained from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. So any possible conversation that we have about the relocation of the boat launch does need to include conversations with the Minnesota DNR to determine even if that's feasible from their perspective, for them to kind of review what our plan is uh, from a grant perspective, from our, our an agreement perspective that we have from them. But I think if you look holistically at the downtown plan, there's also a lot of other areas that sort of circle around the DNR sphere of influence. There's a lot of other projects that sort of touch into where the DNR would need to be at the table as we start to kind of go through that next level of analysis. Um, kind of at a high level, those projects include the boat launch, trailer parking, um, the addition of transient boat slips to downtown, um, any expansion of a marina or your boat club services that are, are down there, um, the addition of non-motorized boat launch um, dock services, and as well as the shoreline enhancements that are envisioned um, in, the, in the downtown plan. So rather than engage in numerous conversations over the course of a couple of years with the DNR, uh, one thing that we had a conversation of was to sort of expand that sphere for just the downtown study scoping and include some of those other areas where when we have those conversations with the DNR, we can kind of say, here's our entire plan for downtown. What are your thoughts on transient boat slips? What are your thoughts on marina expansion? So they A, get a better idea of what we're trying to do um, and they can offer feedback at one time versus sort of this piecemeal approach if we kind of do this in individual studies. So what's out laid, uh, laid out in the memo is an initial scope, this kind of an initial draft skeleton scope of what a proposed study would look like. Um, I do have this sort of in a header format where you kind of have the, the, um, the study item and then some possible deliverables that are in there. Um, bear in mind, this is very, very skeleton at this point. Um, but what I'd like to do is kind of go through those and look for some feedback from the EDA and say, is this in alignment with what the EDA would want to kind of see a study look at? Um, and if there's anything that is missing, we can add those in. Um, but also be cognizant of the fact that when this does go out for uh, consultant review, they're going to fill a lot more of those deliverables in based on their past experience and what they kind of see with this. This is, again, wanting to make sure that we don't miss anything sort of on that initial um, outreach. Um, uh, one other thing that came up as well as I was reviewing this was, can you, can you give me a screen here for one second? You can also see here from this map, um, huh. let's try it again. Well, what I'm trying to show here is if you look at the map that's on the, in the downtown plan, you sort of see like some of the options for locations are really dependent upon that boat launch that's being there. So like the transient boat says, for example, if we can't move that boat launch, are not gonna be in this location here, they're gonna be down here. So we start to see how at least some of the, you know, the expanded scope makes, does make a lot of sense when we're looking at this so we can really get that holistic approach to really sequence these out, get those locations known um, so we're not just sort of doing these kind of piecemeal, um, like I stated. Um, looking at a scoping um, option here. So on the boat launch relocation, um, a couple of the items that I had included in here would be coordination with the DNR and the feasibility of the boat launch move. So make sure that we work with the DNR to see, is it feasible? Is it even possible to move the boat launch? <coughs> for them to identify possible alternative locations for the boat launch and the boat trailer parking as well as cost projections for alternative locations. It's sort of the initial scope there. Is there anything that the EDA sees that I'm missing from that or would like to see added to that boat launch, the specific the boat launch item here? Well, it would make sense to add cost projections for alternative parking. It, leave, the, leave the boat launch where it is, but we, one of the idea we talked about was having offsite parking. I mean, could that be included? 
That was my that was my com my thought as well is that it's not just an and but it's an or the boat launch might stay where it is but we might move the trailer parking mm -hmm. and so I don't know I don't know if there's any DNR requirements related to proximity of parking it would be good to know that and then also include cost projections but yeah I think I mean I doubt the DNR is going to have much energy about if we have offsite parking but you know the cost Maybe as far as land or the whatever current agreement might have something related to a re there is a there is I think those things are tied together in the current agreement Dana there's some language in there that says you need to maintain a number of spaces adjacent to the ramp um, but if you look through the agreement the language is a little bit the copies I have it's not crystal clear you need to maintain you know 15 spaces for example it's sort of the number isn't spelled out, so as part of those conversations, I think identifying what that parking requirement is would be definitely helpful in terms of knowing what the space requirements are for parking. Go ahead. So, um, do we want to go through these or just, which is fine, because I just have some concerns about the overall concept of, of another study here. So do you want me to mm -hmm. wait till we get through these to have those conversations or, okay. Yep. <clears throat> Is there, are there other points related to a boat launch that we might want to have considered and whether that's an in internal staff work or an external study? Are there other maybe points of consideration that we should consider? I know there's the whole question of would we do it at all <laughs> that still is there, but um, I think maybe bringing information to the table to help inform that decision is kind of where we're at. Are there, there, you know, opportunities for additional grants. I'm sure that would be, you know, that would be part of the uh, funding, questioning from funding the funding sources. <coughs> yeah, good call up. Anything else specifically to this particular item? Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's a good list. And then moving on to the uh, the transient boat slips in the marina expansion. Um, first, would be to determine the best location for the transient boat slips. And I think as you, as I mentioned on this other map here, some of that's going to be dependent upon if that launch is able to be moved. What is the best location for those transient boat slips? If you can't move it, you know, obviously I think that sort of answers that question. But that would be part of that you know additional scope there would be. Um, possible determining the best location, coordinate with the DNR on the requirements for adding additional boat slips, um, see if there are any dockage requirements that the DNR requires, coordinate with both the DNR and at this point the Your Boat Club on the requirements for any possible expansion of the My Boat Club Marina, and then as well detailed project cost projections uh, for this one. Is there anything on here or is it implied, is it assumed that we would be looking at number of slips, like what is max capacity? Should we specifically call that out? I'd be interested to know if max capacity is based on a number that is from the DNR or is that a number that is more self-determined based on how staff recommends we use that space? Um, yeah, I think that's one thing we do have to find out. I think it's not clear when you talk to the DNR all the time, with boat slips particularly, whether you have a marina or how much that can be or can't be. Uh, I think a municipal marina like we'd probably envision here might be a little different as far as the numbers go um, than a private association or a private homeowner. So I think that's something we have to clarify within this. Other considerations specific to transient boat slips, marina expansion? Yeah, so then, so that de define the difference between transient slips versus actual marina where they're leasing for a, for a, a season. Yeah, I, I think what we'll have to see is, for example, my boat club is a kind of a private marina, I bet it's small. I think that we should be looking at uh, permanent slips, possibly the possibility of permanent slips versus day use slips. And I think that's what we need to look at. I mean, w the reason we're bringing this is because we know that downtown and the, and the lakefront and the boats are important. And we're trying to look at this holistically. So I believe that if we look at a permanent marina of some type, whether we can do it or not, what the cost is, versus just an extended dock 
for example, that has 20 slips for day use. I mean, I think we have to look at that too. Yeah, and I think just to, on that point, you know, like I look at the marina side of it as, you know, right now the operator is my boat club or your boat club is the operator that's in there. Uh, but the transient slips would be those on, people want to come in from the lake. You have so many spots reserved for those that are more like the boat parking lot that's on the lake, you know, but all of those are dock slips. And that, I don't know if, on the DNR's perspective, does it all qualify in this whole number of slips that you get? Is the marina classified as different use versus transient slips? So all that needs to get sort of determined. So, you know, downtown, you can put this many number of spaces there for boats and then divide those up between marina spaces versus transient spaces, how well they get allocated down the road. And the other thing that's really not called out to is really intended here is that the lake associations talk about having an extended fishing pier and we'd have to bring that into the mix as well. Because then all of a sudden you have a marina, a pier, my boat dot, boat Swimming line, so beach. we have to really kind of make sure that's all, you know, we don't want to clutter it all up. We want to make it do efficient space and make it look nice as well. Right, because people talk about a view shed, but that's you're on the park and you can't see it. That is yep. that would be a valid concern, and they need to you see. At one time, didn't we ha didn't we have a proposal before? I think it was before council on doing some dredging, of around some of those some of those dock spaces, um, because I think depth of water is a limiter on some of that space. Um, is now a time to, if we're considering density of density of slips and how we're using that space, is now a time to consider and to understand if that is even a possibility. Um, I, I think we should, if it's, I think if, if we don't know the answer to that, I think we should we should get the answer to that because I think that's also going to be a governor on what we what we do there. There, to that point, uh, President Bain, there had been a proposal that I think it got to Parks, Lakes, and Trails a number of years ago regarding, uh, like, it was based on the like, classic wooden boats that have the direct drive props that you can't tilt up or down, and limiters, you can't bring those two in, because that's really shallow in there, and they did some sounding, you know, they brought a depth stick down, like, you'd only use, like, a portion of that dock to bring those type of boats in. So like basically, even if you had a 100 foot dock or a 200 foot dock, the last 75 feet were only usable, the first 125 feet weren't usable because it was too shallow. That's where some of the dredging proposals or conversations were starting to say, can we dredge this area out? Because I believe, I'm speaking just from memory of using that access there, I believe that access had been dredged out to allow for boats to get in and out of there because it is quite deeper by the access versus immediately adjacent, it gets pretty shallow in there. So I think that depth conversation with the way it currently sits, I believe your first so many feet of dockage is gonna to be tough to bring a boat in just because of the, shit, the depth of water that I don't think you can float a boat or a very shallow draft boat would be able to float in there. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're gonna engage the DNR in a conversation, we might as well see if they're open to. At least understand what options are. Mm -hmm. Cost very well might be a prohibitor, but I think at least to understand what is the, what is the possibility. Anything else specific to transient boat slips, marina expansion we should consider? Okay. And the <clears throat> final one is the shoreline enhancement. Um, one of the options here is determine the best location for the canoe, kayak, beach landing, and lock stanchions that were envisioned in the plan. Uh, develop a plan for the uh, shoreline restorations and enhancements. Um, coordinate with DNR on what the project requirements I should also add watershed, if there's any watershed requirements for project re requirements. Um, ID any possible cost sharing opportunities for projects. Um, given the fact that this is directly adjacent to Lakeside Memorial Park, and one of the feedbacks that we had from the Parks, Lakes, and Trails Commission was wanting to make sure that they were engaged if um, any type of improvements to the park or shoreline adjacent, they were engaged in those conversations. So the you know part of this a scope would be to have them coordinate meetings with parks, lakes, and trails to ensure that restorations and enhancements are in alignment with future park plans and sort of what the park, lakes, and trails vision is for the park. And then as well as detailed project cost projections here as well. Um, anything else that I'm missing on the shoreline enhancement portion of it? 
The only other thing that I was thinking about was, and this may fall into this bullet point or maybe somewhere else, but it, it, as a part of the overall downtown study, there was talk about the snowmobile access off of which street mm -hmm. was it? Was it second? second. Is it second? That's going to be a shoreline impact. I mean, maybe it makes sense to include that here. That is a good call out also. And any limiters of, I mean, this is where you're going, but any limiters <coughs> from either watershed or DNR on that? Oh. It'd be good to know. We should probably already know because we already do it today. <laughs> but well, it's being done. But it's just whether or not yeah, we're going to actually, yeah. you know. Or what our enhancement capability is to make yeah. it even better. Yeah, agree. That also, though, might bring up some grant, some access to some different types of grant funds that we should look at specific around snowmobile enhancements, if there's some either tourism or snowmobile association specific grants that kind of breaks open perhaps a, a, a different grant pool for us. Great. Any, anything else related to shoreline enhancements? Like maybe you had some maybe upstream comments on just overall kind of study, or do you want to maybe kind of tackle? We so do you. Well, maybe you, is there a price that we're kind of associating with this? We're just going to put this out for bid to see what, based on what we're looking for. Is that I'm guessing that's the next. I step. don't think we have a cost estimate at this time. I think we need to put it out and see what that cost estimate is, and if it's outrageous, I mean, scale back or at least chunk it in chunks, but. I don't think it'll be, I mean, we're not talking a lot of draw, you know, engineering drawings or all that. It's more conceptual and then discussions with what we can and can't do at the DNR. Well, some, some of the staff will do some of that, but I think we bring it back with whatever the cost is first. I, I guess as far as Bruce's team and because this was such a big part of the whole downtown plan, I'll be honest, a little disappointed there wasn't some conversations with the DNR. I know maybe there was an attempt and that, but it just seems like <clears throat> Some of this stuff should have been included in that initial, especially when a big piece of it was moving, moving that ramp. I mean, that it was the that was the biggest piece or the biggest change, and it just seems like that should have been in that initial scope. Um, and, and I know maybe I heard that they he attempted to make some contact with with them, but that that seems like that. Should and I think been. a lot of that came up during the discussion, so it wasn't in the original scope of the of the project. Uh, when Bruce was retained. So I think moving the boat dock, or boat launch, I should say, came up with the public meetings and things like that. So I'm not sure how much we really actually allowed him to scope that out and understand that. So. I do think part of this, um, I, I think this some of this fits within kind of staff responsibility or just kind of institutional knowledge that we should have as a city um, you know there's this mix between some of this is going to be around regulatory structure and what are the requirements and some of it is going to be around kind of design to plan and so um, I'd be interested in maybe kind of going to if, whether that's Bruce or a, a service provider to say what might a what might a shared project plan look like and just being specific on some of this city staff's going to take the lead on and in or or do it jointly that maybe helps to bring down some of Bruce's time um, and to look at it more as a shared project than us just whole scale pitching all of this I know some of that also relates to based on what we've put on your collective plates and so um, timing is important too, based on when we might have staff capacity to <coughs> prioritize and do the work. But I'd be interested in seeing what a shared work plan model might look like and how we might have shared hours. Um, just so that we're not, I mean, some of those are just it's key foundational information that we should know um, and, and have the kind of the background context um, around some of those requirements. 
I don't know, other thoughts around how this gets bundled or packaged? Yeah, I mean, this is a small thing, but let's change the name of it because it's way more than the boat launch. I'd hate, I'd hate for the DNR to get presented with this idea of boat launch and they say no and then everything else gets scrapped. Like there's important things, some of it's low hanging fruit, some of it's moving mountains or boat launches. But um, I mean, let's make sure that, you know, when we come to the table with the DNR, who's an you know, important partner, that they recognize that there's several things that we want to see happen here. And if one is a 10 year plan and there's some that are six month plans, right. let's do what we can. That is a that is a good good call out. It's more of a, you know. Waterfront usage. Yeah, municipal waterfront u usage or public waterfront usage questions. I could also <clears throat> add that it, it's, it just seems since we have this lake and Clear Lake and other lakes that just somehow to have a better contact or a go-to person with the DNR and I know there's so many different departments and things, it's hard to chase that down. You know, I saw something over the weekend on social media about questioning about uh, duck hunting on the lake. And someone reached out to someone in the city and they said, well, that's the DNR. The DNR said it was, so like just, just more of a communication. I know that's easier, <laughs> harder than, the, easier than said than done, but it's just something to, because sure. there's just so many issues with the, that were tied in with the DNR that that communication, whoever that is, or would, would help them just that more than just this. Yeah. Other, I guess, points of clarification or feedback points, Dan, Patrick, that would be helpful to support. Time. Just one thing I forgot to mention earlier on, we were talking about Bruce. Um, after the downtown plan was approved, Bruce actually has left HKGI and is now out on a new uh, planning firm. Um, I always mispronounce the name of his company that he's now with. I think it's Talali Collaborative. Um, I did speak with him last week to make sure, you know, A, are you still in the planning game? Does this fit into your new sort of work plan? Are you sort of in this industry? He did confirm that yes, he's still working on planning. This downtown planning type work is definitely something that's still in his wheelhouse, it's still in his firm's wheelhouse. And then I also asked him, I said, based on the fact that you're with the new company, do you have capacity? If we were to bring something back, would you be able to, to do the work or would it be something that you, know, you don't have capacity right now? Um, he did confirm that he does have capacity for that. So he is available if we decide to go back and continue with Bruce. Uh, since he was the lead author of that, there's a little bit of a turnkey ability. He knows the plan, he authored the plan, has the relationships there. Um, but he is with the new firm now, and but he again has capacity, and it's definitely something that's still in his wheelhouse of what the firm does. So, not a, he didn't switch to go work for some other type of industry, he's still in the planning game. That's good to know. So, then an uh, uh, update, and where does that put us with the, that small scale study, additional study we did on the block, the, the Gone or Vanelli block? Where does that leave us there, or where's that at? Uh, he's come back with some renderings of parking and Boulevard space, and we're using that as our discussions go forward with, with the developer. So, we're we haven't engaged with him lately, but some of the initial things that he has done for that has helped us continue those and make move those forward, those discussions forward. So, <clears throat> if we need to go back to that, we will. Is there an opportunity for us to see that that study? Uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's not really a study; it's more just renderings of parking and street width. But yeah, we can I'd be happy to share that. So was, was that initial contract complete then? Or is, is it with the old firm or to go with him? Or? Open or with the I think the bulk of the work had been completed. I know I think he's maybe outstanding one or two, like maybe a yeah, follow-up so meeting. Too. You know, but it's, he's agreeable to assist us as we need to kind of, if there's any loose ends on there to, you know, I don't want to speak for him, but you know, my past conversations, we still have a pretty good relationship. So if there is a question or I need some follow-up, he's able to answer those questions for us. But, um, I believe the bulk of that scope was done when we've, because we've met a number of times with both him and with Gunn yeah. in, that, in, in relation to that extended work or extra work. Yeah. Other questions on this topic? Because I think our next, um, well, community development update might also provide some more discussion point around that, that exact question, so. Yeah, good question. Hey, Jenny, any any points of feedback or any member of the public, any points of feedback on um, the launch or the study? 
water recreational water use study as we now perhaps re re-termed it? Uh, Blake and Leaf um, both addressed my questions, so Excellent. they did a good job. Very good. Okay. Dan, you have, what, you have what you need from us? I do, thank you. All right. Let's move on to commercial incentive program update. Uh, President, members of the EDA, um, this is on the agenda tonight as a check-in. It's probably been a while since we've seen this uh, policy update. Um, I do have this right now. This is currently what the attorney is making sure that all the I's are dotted and T's across to make sure that there's not a fair running a fall of any state uh, statute. Um, I wanted to get EDA feedback on this prior to bringing it back for, for recommendation for approval. Um, kind of a, a, a second check-in on this, if you will, um, kind of a refamiliarization. Uh, just to kind of give a little bit of background on it, uh, this was a pretty big overhaul of the existing downtown incentive policy or downtown incentive policy that we approved back in 2015. Um, that policy um, has one-time abatements of up to $5,000, reduced permit fees, and a 10-day building permit turnaround time. Um, that program has been in place since 2015. We see about one to two applications per year um, on that. Uh, but one of the main things on that initial policy was that it was really confined to the downtown area. We did a little bit of an expansion, so we got a little bit outside of that, but primarily it was designed for downtown. This new policy that's here um, greatly expands that area to include almost all the commercial areas within the city of Forest Lake. Um, it also takes in the feedback that I heard from applicants or those who are considering applying for the program over the past three to four years to make sure that it's more in line with what the business community was asking for as they came in and applied for this program. So just to kind of highlight some of the updates uh, that are there or in this uh, improved or this new policy, um, it's kind of what I started out with was that one of the things that we did here was we changed it from an abatement to a grant. Um, that's just a vernacular change that's there. Um, that aligns this program more with what I saw with other communities, how their commercial incentive programs are. They're more on the grant ver uh, verbiage versus uh, abatements. Um, additionally, there's a name change to it. The previous name was Downtown Incentive Program. The new program is called the Commercial Improvement Incentive uh, Program. That's to reflect the larger scale. So we're not just downtown anymore, we're almost all commercial areas. So it's more reflective of the expanded uh, area. Uh, we did remove the reduced permit building fees and expedited permits. Uh, two reasons for that was as I went through this review uh, last year, having a conversation with the building department, there was some concern that if we did reduce permit fees for almost all the commercial areas within the city, that could have a pretty significant impact on the revenues that the building department generates. Uh, so we recommended not keeping that language that was in there. And then also on the expedited permits, um, the building department has improved their turnaround time pretty tremendously since this program was initially um, in, enacted. And ever since this program was enacted, that sort of expedited permit turnaround time was really tough to kind of quantify. It was sort of like, do you get a 48 hour turnaround? What if we're waiting on something? What if we're not waiting on something? So we're still doing first in, first out, but with our current turnaround times and our current uh, lead times on permit applications, at expedited permit language is kind of a moot point because it ended up causing more confusion than anything else that was there. So we did remove that as well. Um, we did expand the qualified zoning districts. Originally it was MU1 uh, was the main district that was associated with this one. We now have MU1, uh, MU2, general mixed use, uh, B1 Broadway business district and neighborhood commercial. So again, we've expanded that pretty significantly. Uh, we added some language on the data practices um, there was some feedback that I received from the local business community that they're a little bit of apprehensive to submit some financials to the city. They wanted to kind of know, what do you need that data for? What are you gonna do with it? So there's some language in there that just says, you know, what we're collecting it and how it'll be used. So they have a better understanding of the process of why we're collecting the information that's there. And the biggest change is probably the most requested change that I've had from the business community was to do uh, a scale for grant awards. Um, I, I, I've, we found out that that $40,000 point of entry for this program for a lot of businesses was just too steep, that they weren't ever gonna do a $40,000 <coughs> exterior renovation to their building, uh, but still wanted some level of, of grant for a smaller, app, a smaller improvement that's made. 
So we do have a proposed a graduated scale here that does offer them to do smaller applications and still get a reduced grant amount for that project. I also want to note that even though this has sort of been on the back burner since we're doing a lot of downtown planning, this has not negatively impacted anybody's application. Um, anybody who's looking to apply on the potentially on this new application criteria, I've told them to hold their applications. When we get this approved, they can then submit at that point. Um, there hasn't been anybody that at this point that's been, you know, basically denied a, denied a program because they don't qualify on the, on the existing one, but they would on the new ones. Um, I anticipate that once this is approved, there are gonna be a handful of applications that are sort of in the wings that will come forward with this. Um, but that is sort of, in a nutshell, just kind of a reminder what the major points of this improvement program or this new uh, commercial improvement incentive program of what those changes are. Wanted to just do a quick check-in with the EDA to see if is this still in alignment with what the EDA wants in this type of program or policy. And if there are any changes, let me know. I can get those incorporated into the final draft that is uh, currently right now with the city attorney. Uh, but next steps is once I get it back from the attorney would be to bring it back for EDA for consideration and approval and then the council for approval. And then this would supersede and become the program uh, for our exterior incentives or improvements uh, within the city of Forest Lake. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions on this new policy or the existing policy. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> Questions, points of feedback? Yeah, I got a couple things. I mean, great work. You obviously incorporated a lot of the things we talked about, um, which looks fantastic. I just had a couple questions um, on page 12 of the deck. It's under item number three, general criteria. Um, talking about ineligible properties. The third bullet says properties which have previously applied for and were awarded a City of Forest Lake CIIP grant would make them ineligible for future funding. Is there a way we can rework that? I mean, so if, if, if um, businesses are doing a graduated, mm. in, you know, spreading out their, their improvements, just because they got in on the first one at, you know, at a $500 grant that precludes them from doing something else. I mean, can we rework that? So maybe there's a cap on the grants that they get from the city, but we're not gonna say it's a one and done. Or also to piggyback on that, also where there's been a change of ownership, right? Maybe the owner, new owner is going to take facade in even a better direction yeah. or more, yeah, um, different direction. That that is, I like that call out. Um, just a point of clarification on the on the kind of the total amount that we want to be awarded. So right now it's five thousand dollars total per property per owner, how we classify that. Would you want that total to remain at 5,000? So if you do two applications cap it at five per, per property, or would you want to that potentially increase to, you know, if you did two $40,000 improvements to the exterior of a building, and potentially come in then at that point for up to 10,000? Because right now it's capped, you know, at the five. Maybe it's a, a, a numerical higher cap within a period of time too. I mean, there's ways of, because I mean, if somebody's willing to spend forty grand this year and another forty next year, like that's that's just helps everybody. Or maybe it's a patio one year and it is a you know significant awning increase or something around completely different part of the building facade. Um, that might it, yeah. It, the, <coughs> There's something, there's something, um, it'd be nice to find a way that would allow for that without it just being an endless stream of, you know, projects that stack on top of each other that are the same project. It, and, I, and I think just from a practicality standpoint is, I think there, there potentially are owners down there that will make large, you know, multiple $40,000 plus investments in the exterior of their building. I, I think though, just from how this long this program has been in place and for some the difficulty in even getting that initial $40,000 cap, I think when most, when some improvements are done, most of the exterior work is done, they don't typically go back in three years and do other work because they've already sort of tackled what they can tackle from an exterior standpoint with that initial one. So maybe just striking that language, you know, completely, because I, I honestly, from a practicality standpoint, you're probably not gonna split a $100,000 improvement into <coughs> multi-year application, you get it all done in one shot. 
Yeah, and by having that criteria on there, then you just have extra staff time trying to right. keep track of right. who did it. How did we land at the $40,000 number? I'm drawing a blank on where we got to that as the, because I, I, I want to say it was done so it was sort of, they wanted to make it to make it a project that was worth incentivizing, you know, so it was like larger scale projects, like full exterior renovations. So I think that's where the $40,000 came from. I don't know if a lot of market research went into it. I think it may have been a number that kind of was like 40,000 sounds like a pretty sizable exterior project, $5,000 abatement as a result of it is, but I think it was trying to incentivize projects that were, I would say meaningful exterior Upscale. projects. Upscale. And it'd be interesting. So we've, we, I, th I mean, there's a self, there's a, a, a limit to financially how many of these we're able to fund. However, in recent history, we have, that fund has not been fully exhausted and we have carried forward. And I wonder if there is, you know, if the goal is to provide the financial incentive, I wonder if dropping the threshold for the project amounts down helps to um, provide some, I, you mean, well, we did scale the project amounts, but you mean keep the, the, the incentive more robust at those or, lower ranges? Well, or allow for projects that are less than 40,000 to also be considered. Yeah. Um, well, at a, at a larger amount. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our goal is to use this as financial incentive and we've kind of dedicated, earmarked a portion of budget and we have not had qualifying projects that have completely, you know, we haven't completely utilized that full budget. And so just from a utilization standpoint, I'd rather have the money out there doing what we want it to do. So you um, have five to 20 at 2,500 and then 20 to 30 at 3,500 or 20 be, to 40? Yeah, I'd be, I guess I'd be interested in kind of feedback. You know, Dan, you see, you see from the application side, maybe where there is, how we might change those parameters to accomplish what we're looking for. Yeah, it's been, you know, I'm kind of going back on my the ones that I've worked through and a couple of property owners was, I mean, we've been pretty generous in terms of what we've accepted as, as exterior, you know, I mean, it hasn't been like, we, you know, I've worked with them to try to get them over that threshold, right? I mean, it's making sure that they do qualify for it, but I think, you know, the number one feedback I get is like a lot of people who are looking for, say, a $15,000 project, they want a portion of, you know, they're saying, well, if I were to spend 40, I would have gotten money back, so why can't I get incentivized to do a smaller project? That's still, you know, I mean, nothing wrong with doing a $15,000 improvement to the exterior building does make a big difference in how that building looks, which is in the spirit of this program. Right. Um, and I, I would say I haven't heard direct feedback in terms of it needs to be this amount of dollars back. It's just more, I think, that the fact that they would qualify for something back, I think, you know, again, it's in the spirit of the program, trying to make the building, the exteriors of the buildings look better in, in the city of Forest Lake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think these are a lot of great ideas here. I don't recall, is there a cap that we can only put, give out so much per year? Is that, that because we could, then make those numbers higher, lower, knowing that if for some odd reason we were to get really hit real hard, there would be a, a cap on overall annual dollars that we're able to, to do. So I, I don't know if I can't remember if I spelled it out in here. Uh, typically we've been budgeting right around $30,000 per year and I believe it comes in on a first come first serve. So at that, you're looking at six applications that go out. If say one year we got 10 that came in, you could go back and say the year before we only did two, so there's a surplus. You could go back through and you know spend that additional funds that's there. There's nothing that says that six, we're done. And we can kind of on a case by case basis, but it does, from the budgeting standpoint, at least lets us know what we're trying to anticipate that's there. And then the years that we don't fully allocate or fully spend those funds, that does go to draw, increase EDA's fund balance. So when we do have larger projects that come in that require incentives, or we have a year where a lot of exterior renovations are done, those fund balances there to fund those projects without having to sort of negatively impact other activities of the EDA. If we were exhausting the budget every single year, then I would say it probably doesn't make sense to 
make these changes because you do want to incentivize larger, more impactful projects. However, that hasn't been our most recent experience and I'd rather, I'd rather have those dollars out there doing what we want them to be doing rather than us waiting for the right project. If I could just throw one caveat on that as well, this program in general has not been exactly heavily advertised for two reasons. Existing policy is pretty, in my mind, it's poorly written and that's why one of the reasons why it needed the upgrade. Um, but once this, on its approval, the, and given the fact that we're expanding the parameters outside of just the downtown, it's always sort of been, I don't know what that's gonna look like from an application standpoint yeah. moving forward. Changing you know, outside downtown it's is It's changing, it's basically changer. changing the entire program. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's not to be said, once these grant levels here are approved, we could very well hear back from the business community. They're too low, they're too high, they're in alignment. We can always go back and change these amounts as a policy update, you know, six months in or a year in, but this is kind of a starting point in terms of where those are. And they do kind of line up with what we've historically budgeted and sort of historically how we've done the program. The other question I had <clears throat> reading through this, is there, is there a timing issue in terms of like when the work is done versus when it's they they apply like if you know we're just talking about possibly running out in the first year but i mean just kind of more broadly speaking is there a time frame we want that work done versus the grant applied for what i've typically told existing applicants is that once your work is completed so when the work is completed and you have all your receipts done make your application and i use applications based on a year cycle on the calendar budget cycle so if you completed your work in 22, but you applied in 23, that would go under 23's application, even though the work had been done in 22. Um, and that lines up with how we've done this in the past. We actually, when this program was first approved, we retroactively approved some existing work that had been done prior to this being in place. So what I always tell applicants is finish your project, keep your receipts. If you have any questions as you're going through the process, if it qualifies or not, let me know. I'm happy to walk through qualifications. But once you complete the work and it's, done and signed off on, submit your applications, and I go on a calendar cycle. So <laughs> even that may take them two years to complete it, it's pretty easy to visually go out there and say, yes, those improvements were made, make the application 23, it gets funded in 23. Nice, awesome, thanks. Well, one other question on, on these uh, eligible criteria. The, the one is uh, evaluated by case, and that's uh, the w landscape and stormwater. What's the, th the thought behind that? or? How, how is that going to be evaluated? Uh, I'm just trying to page that is. Uh, page of 13. 13. I think you, overall, like stormwater features, if you're adding something that has, I mean, I, I think there needs to be a it's exterior. So I think if it's got a visual component to it, I think if you're doing, and you know, that's more on a case by case basis where it's, and and again, staff has been pretty generous in terms of if it qualifies or not, but it's more, you know existing stormwater features if you, instead of just putting in sort of a you know wet pond that has no landscape improvements if you put landscape so it looks nice has that improvement that you're trying to generate that would qualify versus if you just sort of i don't want to say this but dig a hole and fill it with water so you sort of have this green pond on it that might not qualify you want to make sure there's making some efforts to do an improvement that's in the spirit of the program And again, that's guided based off of the overall, pu it's public use based on improving public um, um, uh, public aesthetic. It's, it's based on uh, um, features that are visible to the public, which is why we have to, in the program, eliminate interior features or other considerations. Correct. And, and those businesses that are downtown on 61 that have frontage on 61 and the parking lot or on 61 and Centennial, both front and back would qualify because again, the public sees both front and back. But if you had a front facing business where nobody would see the rear of your business, probably the rear improvement wouldn't qualify because again, that's not something that the, you can physically see. This is more of an exterior facade improvement program. Any other points of feedback? In the open, uh, yeah, question. please. Do we have an anticipated Completion. I know you said you have to take it to the attorneys. So, what what's your ETA? Are you thinking? Uh, ideally, probably November of this year. I mean, I'm looking to get this approved in 22. Is what my goal is. So it's in place for 23. Because I, I know, in speaking with a few people who have uh, asked about applications, I know they're getting close to getting their projects done, and they would be coming in on a smaller application here. So I want to make sure this is in place. And 
it's been sort of on the back burner long enough where I think it's you know something that we can get in 22 for uh, implementation starting in 23. I would ag agree with that, that it'd be nice to get this in place. And so especially before we're too far um, beyond closing out the 22 program year, that if there are some applications that are floating that would qualify, it'd be really nice to get those in for this year. So there's substantial enough time. And I think from, from an attorney review standpoint, it's a pretty minimal review that they've had, and they've had it for a while. So it's, this is something where Perfect. I think it should be, it should sequence pretty quickly from here on out. Excellent. Also, point of, point of note, it might be interesting um, just from a process standpoint. I know you mentioned, Dan, a, a step of approval by council. Um, be, I'm given EDA authority, I'm not sure that that's required, but we'll let that can be kind of an offline consideration that you take on whether whether that step is required or not. I'll, re, I'll double check that because again, I was following sort of past practice on that Understand. and I'll verify if it's not needed or not. If it's not needed, I'll keep it here. If it is, Understand. I'll, I'll Certainly it's a keep council informed consideration, but whether they actually need it for a vote on a meeting might be good to take a look at. And I will, I will look at that, um, the ineligible and draft some language on that as well to get it. So if you s apply for a smaller grant, you can potentially apply for more. So Perfect. I'll get some language on there. Excellent. I think we're ready to transition. Um, and before we transition, any member of the public, Jen, Jenny, any feedback points that maybe haven't already been uh, been? <laughs> no, I really like the idea of a sliding scale, funding the smaller amounts. Excellent. All right, we can move on to community development updates. And Abby, I think this is you. Thank you. Uh, just wanted to run through a few updates that are kind of coming through the community development department right now. I think um, maybe it was your meeting in August, kind of went through some zoning code changes that we're currently looking at. Karen, could you bring up my screen, please? Yep. Um, so I'll bring up a slide that you already seen. We've been looking at three different zoning code changes right now. One is to the mixed residential district. That's the MXR1 that we hear a lot about. One is the uh, review of the Highway 61 corridor and the um, highway business use. We talked briefly about that. Staff's working on some scoping documents for a study. And then also uh, we've talked about with the Planning Commission agricultural compatibility. What kind of land uses, potentially commercial land uses, would be um, appropriate in our agricultural districts? <clears throat> so tonight I just wanted to highlight really briefly on that MXR1 district. So at a... Um, as a recap, the MXR1 district is guided um, or in our comp plan as our low medium density residential district. <coughs> this is the district that is really our guiding land use that's really designed to accommodate that population forecast 2040 of 29,000, nearly 29,000 rest, uh, residents, over 12,000 homes. So just for reference of where we were in the 2020 census, that means we're going to be growing by about 25%, 30% in population, 25% in households. So the area to that we have the highest growth between now and 2040 is that low medium density residential. That's about 60% of the total development that we are anticipated to see. The areas that are guided for that low medium density residential are outlined in the big red boxes here. Of course, this all is dependent on the urban services staging. So even though we've got some big red boxes up here in the northwest corner, we might not have urban services there till 2030. Same with this box here. We've got a line of demarcation where it's, we anticipate we'll have the urban services there by 2030, and then working further south through 2040. So the Planning Commission has been reviewing um, a minimum lot size, which has probably been the sticking point for a lot of the conversation over the last year. Um, we've looked now, uh, right now, the Planning Commission is looking at other neighborhoods that have been approved w between about early 2000s and now, and what are some of those comparable standards or lot sizes, specifically in the MXR1 district. We're seeing in these neighborhoods, Bridal Pass, Chestnut Creek, Hawthorne Heights, Headwaters 9th through 12th edition, forgive me for this one being here, I think this also says Bridal Pass, that might have been an error. but. 
these neighborhoods um, are areas where we're seeing lot sizes as low as 6,500 square feet, 6,000 to 6,500 square feet. We're finding about the average somewhere around that 7,500 square feet. So staff and the Planning Commission are discussing that. Uh, you saw this code amendment process outline. It's been tweaked slightly. We've been having discussions in August and September. But later this month, the Planning Commission will see a redlined ordinance for their review. They'll hold a formal public hearing for their consideration and making a recommendation to the City Council. But we hope to have that MXR1 uh, ordinance amendment approved or in front of the City <coughs> Council in December. Tagging along with this are, will probably be one or two um, agricultural compatible uses. So the Planning Commission has specifically asked us to look at accessory dwelling units as one thing to include in the community. And one thing we are starting to actually field a little bit more phone calls on is the potential of some sort of uh, event center, wedding venue. Um, the whole idea of having these maybe on farms has been a, a popular trend. So those are probably the two we'll look at, but the Planning Commission at their last meeting of this month will kind of direct staff on one other, um, probably one other compatible use. Again, that Highway 61 Highway business, we're kind of scoping out. Before I move on, do you have any questions just about the code changes that we're working on? You mentioned the the study the um, planning commission is looking at what some of those um, recently some of the neighborhoods you mentioned mm -hmm. and as low as lot sizes as low as six thousand to sixty five hundred is yeah. that right and what is the potential like is there a, is there a target number that is targeted for that ordinance on lot size so we have to have a density of three to six units per acre. But what's ending up happening, uh, an acre is about 40,000 square feet. So if you did simple math and you divided that by six, it's coming out to a little under eight. What has ended up, hap has ended up happening in these MXR1 neighborhoods is they are very much littered with wetlands, mm -hmm. wetland buffers. Mm -hmm. So the amount of developable acreage is reduced pretty mm -hmm. significantly. And we're really finding that that is not necessarily reducing the lot size. We're really fortunate, Forest Lake's lot size, or um, excuse me, not lot size, the lot land value. Our land values, comparatively to neighboring communities, are still very low. However, even though you might have a wetland and a wetland buffer, and let's do some simple math and say it's a 10-acre lot and five of it are taken up with, with wetlands and wetland buffers, those underlying landowners still want the price for the value of the 10-acre mm. lot. And so really when we're starting to kind of balance out one land values, but also two, those the undevelopable land areas, mm -hmm. it's really hard for us to get three units per acre right now. Yeah. And the driver for that is bringing down that lot size to be able to get more lots in. Um, I'm happy to either one-on-one -on -one with any of the EDA members and I'll offer it to the council as well is to kind of walk through some of those um, existing neighborhoods that we're looking at. The council will see some of that when those recommendations mm -hmm. come forth from the Planning Commission. I'm not sure what the Planning Commission will decide. Uh, I know that they think 6,000 is too small. And we can look at some of those neighborhoods and think, wow, this is pretty tight. But as we start to kind of increase slightly, what are some of those different attributes that they're looking at that are gonna f weigh into their recommendation? And is part of that analysis of information going to Planning Commission also taking into account the comparison of um, other communities and how other, what other communities are using, and I, I know it, that It that's hasn't, it hasn't. The Planning Commission, there's been some vocal, um, some, they have voiced some opposition to really comparing ourselves to other communities. We have looked at what lot sizes are in some of our comparable communities. We haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty of setbacks and those sorts of things. But we are finding that somewhere between that, I mean, as low as, some of these lots are as low as 5,000 square feet in our neighboring communities. But somewhere between that and about nine is where we're seeing the averages. Understood. Um, that all, all that information we can provide to that has been provided though to the Planning Commission. Understood. Thank you, that's helpful. Yeah. Other questions, points of, points of feedback? Yeah. We, we last we met, we talked about that Highway 61 corridor um, and making a change there. I had a, a, a business owner approach me that's looking at some land down there of 25 acres on the northeast corner, northwest corner of 190th and 61, and 
<clears throat> he's more in construction trade type thing, and it's a large employer, 175 people, and he's being told that it's not allowable there. Correct. Um, is that that is the case, and is there any opportunity for screening or anything? Because we here we are looking to bring in empl em large employers and whatever, and we have someone in our backyard who has 175 plus people, and we're saying no, and probably forcing him out of town. Basically. That has, and I know the employer, we have spoken, that has been part of the catalyst for looking at this Highway 61 and even that highway business um, district along kind of 180th, you know, bordering our border. Um, that has been the catalyst for having that conversation. What I'm, what I'm really finding is just the capacity that our staff has to do that analysis. It would require comprehensive plan amendments and zoning code changes. Those are really um, complex planning processes to put on a private property owner, especially when we're looking at a whole corridor. He's looking at one property, and it's challenging to do those on one property. So yes, I know this. I know the business. I know the intended use. I think that there is the possibility that that might be an appropriate use. It's just we'd have. To, we really want to look at this as that corridor, so we're not ending up with too much patchwork development through here, but it is true that currently those kind of construction businesses or contractor service businesses aren't allowed on the Highway 61 corridor. Our, the corridor was guided for more retail, commercial, and multifamily uses. You, know, you, you go through other communities and you see where it, they, they, they marry together fairly well if it's screened right and done right, where you have some commercial some housing and then a, a manufacturing or warehouse that, if it's tastefully done, I, I think works. I, I would hope that we, and to, to lose an employer like that would be. There's portions of that corridor that are also split guided where we have that kind of mixed use in front and maybe residential, you know, in the back. And so part of the thing that I'm kind of scoping out right now is really looking at is there an opportunity for some mixed use that we could, you know, really have that highway commercial that we're looking for but maybe allow for some of those um, larger outdoor storage types of things to be situated a little further from the highway. Uh, I know that this, we talked at our last meeting about that and about that scope. It'd be my plan to have that back for you in November to really look to start moving forward with what can we do along this corridor to get something moving along there. I know the property, I know the business, and this has been at the you know, forefront of <coughs> that intersection between community development and economic development. Um, just moving on, just another kind of, most people don't think of it necessarily as an economic development thing, but the Parks, Trails, Lakes Commission and staff have been updating the Parks, Trails, Open Space Master Plan. This, we have received, a, staff has received a draft of the plan. We're working with our consultants on refining some of the recommendations. That'll be going out to the public, uh, to our Parks Commission, uh, probably the council in November. So that's something that's kind of coming forward, looking at the park system, trail system, open space system as a whole, and how is that gonna guide us for the next 10 to 20 years in just the development of these systems that definitely help improve our communities. And then lastly, I just wanna let you know, we are fielding lots of developments still. We probably have about three to six residential developments in the hopper at any given point. Some of them have taken a back seat uh, for a couple different reasons. One, just the market climate. There's a lot of unknown factors in the development world and prices are rising pretty dramatically. Um, the other one is a lot of developers are really waiting to see what the city does with the MXR1 district. It's a district right now that requires a 12,000 square foot lot, and if we changed it to eight, that significantly changes the design, the engineering, and they're reluctant to put a lot of funding forward uh, beforehand. But we did receive a PUD, that's called a planned unit development, for the Shadow Creek Estates property. So this is Shadow Creek Riding Stables, I believe is what it's mm -hmm. called. Um, the development plan on this 38 acre parcel would be to reserve the par a parcel about 12 acres that the farmstead, let's say the arena, um, horse pasture land would be retained. And that's something that's very much supported in our comp plan. How do we still keep our, our agricultural uses, especially those that are a draw or are you know, contributing to the local economy? It would end up having a road that would come in. Back here would be single family residential, about 24 lots. 
potential for 36 townhomes buffering between those um, single family lots and then also two new multifamily apartment buildings that would have maybe up to 130 units on there. Wow. So this is a larger scale development for us, multi-use, uh, multi-residential, mixed residential. That should be moving forward to the Planning Commission in November, but otherwise we're not really seeing too many developments kind of moving forward right now. No um, significant commercial development applications have been coming in, but we do have a few in the hopper that are bringing in some um, new re um, commercial, but not new t to Fort Lake. So some automotive-based uses that we already kind of have, nothing too exciting that way. I will note that in your November meeting, we will, you will review a preliminary concept plan for a major redevelopment project downtown. So the Planning Commission later this month will look at the GON development project um, and the multi-use nature of that. I say preliminary concept, no application has been submitted, but because with a project of this size, I really wanted the developer to have these kind of open conversations with the Planning Commission, the EDA, and the City Council before they formulate applications. Um, there's also some opportunity, I think, for some public-private partnership in there that we'll talk about as we keep moving forward. Um, but those conversations have been occurring. And just to touch on your um, inquiry, Commissioner? Not Commissioner. Member. Member, <laughs> Member Roberts. Um, we did share some of the analysis that we'd done with our downtown planning consultant with the developer. They're well aware of kind of that position that we're in in terms of where, how that's going to help shape and guide their development going forward. So it's been, I think, <coughs> a pretty collaborative working relationship thus far. I, I'm excited to start bringing this in the public realm and start talking about where, where we're going to go with that um, pretty significant development downtown. And the only other thing I just wanted to update, um, we have a new planner that had started a little over a week ago, Ken Roberts. Ken comes to us with a lot of background in planning and zoning. He is getting himself antiquated into the zoning world as we start to phase out kind of daily services with Bolton and Minx. He might have interacted with either Nathan or Franny, maybe not as the EDA, but in a different capacity. So. You won't be seeing them as much, but we will still be using some of their services as we move forward with some of these developments that will really help free up my time to be focusing more on economic development things. So, you guys have any questions just about things that are going on? Anything that I can maybe help answer? I, I, Go I ahead. Do, uh, that uh, Shadow Creek yeah. uh, stable, or, uh, that concept, you know, having that open land. You see that a lot of other places. Marine on the St. Croix has Jackson Meadows where you have you know, the, the density, but then acres and acres of open land. There's a nice development down in Bayport that does the same. Is that, I mean, you're not seeing much of that in Forest Lake. Is that something that can be, you know, talk about the wetlands and there's that natural space right there. And so maybe that helps with it maybe more dense on certain areas, but not f throughout the whole development. Yeah, so um, we're seeing Shadow Creek is, you know, they're really looking to preserve that commercial, agricultural commercial. Um, some of those other newer developments to the east of here, so uh, Birchwood Estates, Good View Preserve, these are things that are kind of in that Chestnut Creek area. Um, the amount of wetlands that are, are really on these properties, I can't say being found, but, you know, really being discovered, these are tillable acreage being farmed. And once you do a wetland delineation, you realize that it's actually a wetland that's been farmed. Well, that wetland needs to be preserved. So there's a high amount of natural resources that are being preserved through these developments. One example, um, Goodview Preserve, I want to say at probably 40% of the entire 20-acre parcel is, is wetland and wetland buffer. So it does make it tricky. We can kind of still get roads through there and that sort of thing, but this is part of the argument for why we might need to increase density in these areas as well. It is a little tricky because you don't see these like big open fields, but it's big open space that's still being preserved. Um, so we see it maybe just not as much as the areas that are on higher ground than us. Other points or questions? It just, um, you know, as we're thinking about sequencing and priority and timing and just 
making sure that our zoning matches up with market demand. Um, I just think we need to continue to keep an eye on and even potentially accelerate what we're doing with that Highway 61 corridor. And for the reasons that the example that just came up, um, I, th I, I think that, you know, if you look at that corridor between Forest Lake and Hugo, I can appreciate why our comp plan included what it included, but now if you look at current economic factors and just how, how what has developed and where our opportunities are. Um, and also we, you know, we just identified another project that's potentially two, you know, two multifamily buildings. Um, I am concerned without a pretty significant change there pretty quickly that we're just gonna end up with multifamily building after multifamily building, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's different than what was intended and what was what I think was intended by that comp plan as designed was intended to be a truly mix. Um, I think, it's, again, it's just the market factor pushing towards residential and the types of commercial or industrial that we might see um, is excluded, unfortunately, and so. I completely agree, and I, especially in this just last few weeks or so with this transition of bringing in new staff, um, it's been hard to kind of focus on some of those long range planning or development, economic development, but it is definitely one of the top priorities in terms of our, our anticipated needs in um, planning studies. It is gonna require us to pull in some outside help. Um, that's why I wanna get that scope back to you next month so that we can right. work with the county on a pre-development grant for correct. some of that funding. Yeah, correct. Go ahead. You, you mentioned the, the inquiry on some events and farm type things. Uh, where, and this is before your time obviously, but the, 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 the development or the event center out at the airport. That kind of surprised staff and everyone involved, and it, it looks like it's a, a great uh, venue. What was obviously they're they're able to continue operating out there, and you know how does that affect these other inquiries where people are looking for something maybe more? I understand the state is part of that because it is airport, but just curious on on where that is and how that affects us going forward. <coughs> I don't think it affects the other areas of the city as far as event centers go. I mean, it's that has to do with what the market will bear and where we where we want it as far as zoning, where it'll qualify. Uh, the event center at the airport, while we know it's there, uh, is still presenting some challenges. Uh, it needs to come into some compliance that it has not come into right now, and we have sent them a, a detailed explanation of what they have to do, how they have to do it, and we'll work with them to get to wherever we get to, to keep that business operating. But there's certain life safety issues that they have to to, to comply with and, and things like that. So they're operating, we sent them a letter, we sent them a checklist, and we will be working with them to try to keep them operating for as long as they wish. There's also been um, a number of neighborhood complaints on noise, and so there is some concern on I mean, it, it's not, it has not been a necessarily a, a smooth first couple of months. So. Um, all right. Uh, we do have, we don't have a Washington County update tonight, but Nan is here, and I'd love to hear a Forest Lake Chamber update if you have one. Well, hello. Uh, let's see. Um, I wrote down some notes so I could uh, be efficient with your time tonight. Um, first of all, at the chamber, we've been f busy. Uh, at the end of summer is quite hectic for us. We have lots of big events, and so wrapping those up. And then we moved right into our new fall offerings. And so, uh, so it's been a booming time as far as we're glad. We're glad to be out and about and seeing people again, as well as uh, I've been onboarding a new staff member. So that's been good. Um, we do have coming up relatively soon our annual awards gala, so looking forward to that in November and then wrapping up our schedule for 2023. Um, I do want to mention that we're looking at reinventing the Lakes Area Expo, doing something a little bit different, same but different, a little more components to it and perhaps outside. And so really want, uh, that's as we wrap up the rest of the schedule so that I can put my time and energy into that. 
Um, we've also been celebrating uh, lots of new and new to come or soon to come businesses and so put that intention out there to want to uh, promote and celebrate and so they've been coming forth and so that's been good. Um, let's see, we also have been doing some partnership work uh, with the career launch program. We met a couple months ago and so really excited about some things that are coming forth on that avenue working with the schools and then also um, potentially a new platform to draw business and uh, the students together. Um, so I'm uh, just waiting for the final details on that to see when that is gonna be released. And then lastly, we did, I don't know if you remember, but last, I believe it was a year ago, I think it was in October, we did that big, um, it was, we did it for our community, but also for all of Washington County. We surveyed the businesses to see what their anticipated needs going forward would be. So this was not for new businesses, but for current businesses that we're looking to expand or grow. And so the work with that has um, uh, culminated in what's called the What's Next CEO program. And so the website is up, and so uh, the program portion of that is going to be promoted, and so uh, lots of really great resources between that and the Size Up program. Both, both of those co uh, partnerships are with Washington County. So real, um, so there's the Washington County update. Really excited about both of those because those are really strong programs for our uh, local businesses. So I think that covers it. Any questions? Any questions for me? No? All right. Thank you. Thank you. With that, we are at the end of our planned agenda this evening. Unless there's any other questions, I will entertain a motion. Go ahead. Uh, um, maybe update on backfilling the two open positions on the EDA and applications, if there's much interest in that. We have a number of applications in the hopper, and um, yeah, you need to, clearly, you need to take some action on getting those positions filled. So. Okay, um, with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Also move. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor, signal by saying aye. 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 Oppose, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.